This is part seven in our series, The Invisible Return of Jesus Christ. And we are currently examining the covenantal transformation context of 2 Corinthians chapters 3 through 6. They are all to be connected. They cannot be separated because they are dealing with the same uh, content. That is, what was happening during that very, very important and interesting transformation period from Christ's resurrection to the destruction of the Jewish temple. Now, so many people have come up with these odd ideas commonly referred to as already but not yet. We see something radically different in scripture and so much more beautiful actually uh, that they as a body of Jewish Christian believers were being transformed as each one of those elect Jews, Romans chapters 10 and 11, and of course, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, as those elect Jews were coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Check it out for yourself. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 is very clear about this. But we're dealing with this subject of light. The subject of light, that is the invisibility of light, which we have, we all would agree that the light we have in Christ is not a physical light, that vindicates an invisible kingdom and thus the invisible return of Jesus Christ. But we must, again, as I have mentioned, ask three important questions. Do we believe it was fulfilled? We've already shown that. Where was it prophesied? And was it to be a double fulfillment? Obviously, no. There's no place in Old Testament scriptures Old Testament, I say, there's no place in the Bible, the prophetic scriptures of the messianic kingdom that divides it, number one, by 2,000 years. In other words, that Christ would come, but then have to resort to a a secondary plan or an interim period. Uh, And then finally, he would become king thousands of years later. It was not like that at all. There was one kingdom prophesied. There was one living waters, one light one eternal kingdom, one everlasting life, one swallowing up of death and victory, one redemption, one ransom. It was all one kingdom. It's all connected. There were not multiple kingdoms. And I have shown in my article, uh, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, is there a difference? I have shown conclusively that they are synonymous. But what we're examining specifically here is this issue of light, this issue of light. Where was it prophesied? Was it to be a double fulfillment? And we're focusing on light. We touched on Job 33 and then several passages in Psalms. And now we are moving to Isaiah. But first, it is specifically related to this uh, chapter 4 in 2 Corinthians, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. The light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. And what we're looking at is this particular verse 4, which says that the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they will not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. It is the glory of Christ that is shining. There's one glory, one salvation, one righteousness, one kingdom of God. And that is the light that is invisible, that it is shining, that is shining now. All right, so we're going to move to Isaiah and uh, specifically we're going to look at chapters 42, 49, and of course the chapter of chapters dealing with light, Isaiah 60, which we're also going to come back to uh, as we examine the actual return of Jesus Christ. I, the Lord, verse 6 of Isaiah 42, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. So he's speaking. This is the Father speaking to the Son. I will hold your hand and will keep you and give you for a covenant of the people, for a light of the nations. Now, again, I don't know anyone that would interpret this light to be physical. To open blind eyes. I once was blind, but now I see. We all agree it was spiritual. It's spiritual seeing. It was spiritual darkness and it is spiritual light. To bring out the prisoners from the prison. It was a spiritual prison. It was the prison of sin and death. If anyone commits sin, that person is a slave of sin. To bring out the prisoners from the prison to those who sit in darkness out of the prison house. Isaiah 49. 
And he said, and this again is the father talking to the son, it is but a little thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you for light to the nations a clear refutation of that abominable and shallow doctrine of Israelite only. Clearly three groups. I will give you as a light to the Gentiles, the nations, the goyim, the ethnos in Greek, to be my salvation to the ends of the earth. So light and salvation are synonymous. They are absolutely synonymous. Look at this. Compare it with Luke chapter 2. Simeon has the Christ revealed. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples a light for revelation to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Light and glory are synonymous, and we have obtained both. Now we look at this rather long text, but it is so beautiful and so pertinent to this subject. Arise, shine, for your light has come. He's talking to Israel. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. So light and glory are synonymous. The glory of the Lord. And the glory of the Lord is his face. It is his smile. It is his countenance. It is his presence. And it is his righteousness. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the peoples. But the Lord shall rise on you. It's a sunrise. That's what we're talking about here. Your light has come gross darkness on the peoples. The Lord shall arise on you and his glory shall be seen on you. It's not physical glory, obviously. This is the glory of Christ's light and righteousness demonstrated through love. Let your light so shine before people that they may see your good works. What good works? Mercy and love and forgiveness and glorify your father which is in heaven. So his glory shall be seen on you. People are literally seeing, not physically, but literally seeing the light and glory of Christ as we live out his love and proclaim his exalted person and finished work. And the nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Right? This is all about sunrise. Keep that in mind as we look at this issue of Christ as the light and the bright and morning star. Lift up your eyes all around and see all of them gather themselves together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar and your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall fear and become bright and your heart shall throb and swell for joy. That, my friends, is the kingdom of God. Because the abundance of the Gentiles, the sea, shall turn to you. The wealth of the nations will come to you. A host of camels shall cover you. The camels of Midian. Ephah, all of them from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense. There's a little play on what took place with the queen of Sheba coming to Solomon, whose name means peace. She comes and she brings all these gifts. And she says to Solomon, I had heard of your glory and your fame, but the half had not been told. Well, imagine this is Jesus so much more pronounced and evident. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. What does 1 Peter say? He's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light that you should show forth his praises. It's so beautiful. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together unto you. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister to you. They shall come upon my altar, pleasing me. That's Hebrews chapter 13. We have an altar, he says, that the Pharisees have no right to eat of. He's speaking of the Pharisees in that chapter. And I will glorify the house of my glory. This is all taking place at this time. What is the house of his glory? His people, the temple, the church. Who are these that fly like a cloud and as doves to their windows? Surely the coastlands shall wait for me in the ships of Tarshish first to bring your sons from afar. This is about Gentiles. Their silver and their gold with them. That's uh, Revelation 21 and 22, where the kings bring their honor and glory into the gates of the city. So profound. 
the, to the name of the Lord your God and to the Holy One of Israel because he has what? Why do they come? Why do they come? Because he's glorified them. He's glorified Israel. In that first century church, he had glorified them. And then the Gentiles saw that glory and they come to it. It's all about God's house. I will glorify the house of my glory. And the sons of strangers will build up your walls. Again, pure Gentiles. And their kings will serve you. For in my wrath I struck you, but in my favor I had mercy on you. Therefore, your gates will always be open. Revelation 21 and 22. They will not be shut day or night. Why? To bring you the wealth of the nations and their kings may be led. For the nation and kingdom that will not serve you will perish. Yes, those nations will be completely wasted. The glory of Lebanon will come to you. The fir tree, the pine tree, the box tree together to beautify the place of my sanctuary. It's his church. We are a holy sanctuary built up to God. And I will make the place of my feet glorious. We are Christ's glorious place. Also, the sons of your afflictors shall come bowing to you. No wonder they didn't understand what this meant. They thought it was dominion over the nations. Paul says, no, the triumph is by the gospel, and that's how God subdued the nations and caused them to be drawn to himself. And all your despisers will bow down at the soles of your feet. This is actually beautiful language. They say, another passage, I believe it's in uh, Zechariah, where it says uh, they will grab hold of him, the skirt of him who is a Jew, and say, we have heard that God is with you, and they will call you the city of the Lord. Jesus said, you are a city set up on a hill. We are Mount Zion. We've come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God. They will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Again, Hebrews 12, 22, you've come to Mount Zion. Instead of being forsaken and hated so that no one passes through, I will make you for everlasting majesty, a joy of many generations. You will also suck the milk of nations, suck the breasts of kings, and you will know that I, the Lord, am your what? Savior and your Redeemer, light, glory, rising, salvation of the Gentiles, inseparable from the Savior, the Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. For bronze, I'll bring gold. For iron, I'll bring silver. For wood, I will bring bronze. And for stone, iron. I will also make your overseers to be peace. He is our peace. It's broken down the middle wall of partition, Ephesians 2. And your rulers to be righteousness. That is how we triumph in Jesus Christ, by his righteousness. We are more than conquerors. 2 Corinthians 2, Romans 8. We are more than conquerors against those who accuse us. Why? We're covered by the blood of Christ. Violence will no more be heard in your land. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Comfort my people. Cry to her that her warfare is over. That is Isaiah 40. So there's no more violence in your land. He's made peace of the two, broken down that middle wall. There's no more Jew or Gentile. You're all one in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3. Nor wasting nor ruin within your borders, but you will call your wall salvation. That's beautiful. Compare this with Isaiah 25, 26, and 27. And your gates praise. We are the walls. We are the praise. The sun will no more be your light by day, nor the brightness of the moon give light for you. But what? Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The Lord will be to you for everlasting light. One light, not double fulfillment, one light. And your God is your glory. It is God. He's our glory. Your sun will no more go down, nor your moon withdraw, for the Lord will be your everlasting light. What a beautiful kingdom, and this is inseparable from the new heaven and new earth of Revelation 21 and 22. And the days of your mourning will be ended. Isaiah 61, he will give you beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. We sing the song as if it's fulfilled. There's only one swallowing up of that mourning and death and crying. Surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Isaiah 
53. Your days of your mourning will be ended. Your people will all be righteous. 2 Corinthians 5.21 again. He made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we would become the righteousness of God and the righteousness of God which is by faith unto all who believe. Romans chapters 3 and 4 and of course Philippians chapters 2 and 3. Your people will be all righteous. They will inherit the land forever. What is the land? It's Jesus. Remember what God said. He said, Aaron, you're not going to have any part in the land. I am your portion. I am the lot of your inheritance. I'm your land. Okay? So this is Jesus. We dwell in Christ. The branch of my planting. He wants us to know it was his doing. It had nothing to do with us. It was all his decree, all his decision, all his finished work on the cross and through his resurrection and presence. The work of my hands so that I may be glorified. Not you, that I may be glorified for the glory I've given you. A little one will become a thousand and a small one a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it. In its time, and he did a short work he would do upon the earth. So that is the light of the gospel. It's invisible. There's only one light. That light is Jesus. We've got it now, and it is not something that we have to wait for. It's now and forever. God be praised, and I hope that this has strengthened you in your faith. And please subscribe at NCMI Live and support us at www.patreon.com forward slash in CMI Live. Just go in there and, and you just make a little commitment, five, ten, twenty dollars, whatever you can afford per month. It's a wonderful way to support the proclamation of Jesus as Almighty God and King and His glorious, consummated, and ever expanding kingdom of the increase of His government and peace. There shall be no end. God richly bless you. Stay tuned for part eight.